So we created 1,200 square foot of basement or plus. And so that was a great deal. So it took a year and a half to, to build. Uh, the build cost in the end was two million quid, I think. But she sold it for 8.5. So bought it for, bought it for 5.5, spent two million on, on it and sold it for 8.5. Hey everybody, it's Amadeus, and today I'm sitting with a very special guest, Nick, um, from New Projects, Luxury Design and Build. Nick, thanks for, having, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Appreciate nice it. meeting you. Hi. And uh, would you just mind, uh, well first off, how did you get into interior design? Like, what, How did you even get fall into this industry? Well, um, literally all of my life I've been an entrepreneur. So from, the, from 16 years old, um, I used to um, always sort of create new business opportunities and uh, ideas and um, I always, my dream was always about success and uh, working hard and it took me a long time to work out what I was sort of good at and uh, lots of businesses I used to uh, run, cleaning cars, you know, because there's always money. If you clean a car, you can make money. You can make, you know, that's good. So yeah, uh, I had car washes and then I got into uh, property through a friend of mine who um, asked me if I wanted to become a, a land agent. So that is where I used to go out. I used to, through my network, find off-market property, mm. land, and then I would sort of package up to see, can it get planning approval? Can we build a house on there? Can we extend the property? And then, um, you know, basically the end user would sort of pay fees for that introduction. And uh, I did that for some time. And then off the back of that, someone said to me, Nick, if you find a property, here, invest the money. So basically um, I found this tiny flat in Primrose Hill in London, and we bought it for 200,000 quid. It, it was 300 square feet, a studio, so small, smaller than this office. Um, so we bought it, uh, we spent 30,000 pounds on it, mm. and then we did it in about a month, and then we put it back on the market, and we sold it for 350K wow. the first day it was on the market. Right, so that was, um, how much profit was that? That was a over 100k profit. Oh, it was it was it was perfect. So very quick deal. So obviously the investor was very happy. Okay. And off the back of that, we found another property in Fulham, okay. Holyport Road. And this one was a house in the auction with Savills. Mm -hmm. We bought it for 550. Spent 200 grand on it, doing a side return, mm -hmm. loft conversion, full refurb. Mm -hmm. Put it back on the market, and we sold it for. 900 I think mm. and then off the back of that the neighbors on the property saw our sign and said Nick can you do our house for, for me mm. and that's how new started because wow. people wanted us to do their properties and um, I, what I was always very good at I was very good at sort of self-promotion and mm. marketing and branding and all that kind of stuff and and that's why we created the new brand and we really marketed very, very heavily in the beginning mm. on Google AdWords. Mm, Google Ad, okay, wow. So you jumped over a few things that I do want to touch on. So first off, the car wash. Yeah. How long have we be, were you doing car washing for? So from, I guess, I learned to clean cars when I was probably 16 years old. Well, Trevor, when, when, you, when you're cleaning cars, you've got to sell to the client. So if you've got your nice BMW and you come to me, you're coming to me for a wash or something. Mm -hmm. 
but I, I need to upgrade you oh, okay. to a full valet. Oh. So instead of a tenner, I want to get 70 pounds of you. Oh. So I would, up, I would upsell. So you were learning sales? I was learning sales okay. and then branding mm. and then marketing. Okay. Because that's all cut. So all the jobs I've done, you know, all the businesses I've had, they've all add to my track record and mm. my knowledge, all my failures. You know, you know, I've made money, I've lost money, I've had ups and downs and ups and downs, and, but it makes you tough. Yeah. So, <laughs> So, you know, all the failures you have, it, yeah. you know, don't be afraid yeah. to fail yeah. because you've got to fail to learn. Because if, if, you, if you failed, if I failed for the first time in my, at my age now, at 48, I couldn't cope with it. Mm. But because in my life, I've had, you know, I have, I have been bankrupt mm. twice uh, over the last sort of 25 years. Um, it's not the end of the world because mm. it makes you strong. Yeah. You've got to fail. You've got to put everything on the line yeah. all the time. Yeah. And doing that, you are going to take risks. And you know, and if you do take risks and you do gamble, things do go wrong. But guess what? You know, as long as you're healthy, you're fit, you're strong, you've got your family around you, you keep going and going and going. Fantastic. And Resilient. So, um, and one of the things that I got out of it personally was uh, just creativity. Like when you're at your lowest moments, just because you have to make it, you have to pursue. So like that, that creativity kind of comes out. And then, so take me through, what was the, the earliest, you know, failure um, that you've had? You don't have to go into detail, but like, how did you overcome that? Like what, 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 what advice would you give someone who's going through a huge rut and they want to overcome it? Well, the first failure I had was probably in one of the car wash businesses. And um, I, I, I had a unit, I had a factory unit uh, where I come from in Portsmouth, and um, I cleaned all the cars for the main contract, main dealers like mm -hmm. Rover, BMW. They used to we used to do a collection and delivery service. So we got I was doing a hundred cars a week plus. And you had a team around. We had a team. I had okay. probably five or six boys cleaning cars. It used to be a conveyor belt. Used to the cars used to drive in the factory one way and help yep. clean. Uh, and then we stood collection and delivery. But um, at the time I had sort of, I was young. I think I was like 19 years old at the time. Overstretched myself, became too confident. Didn't really have a grip on finances, mm. spending too much, mm. pretending you've made it. And then that's the problem. And then when it gets quiet in the quiet spells, because throughout the year, you know, business goes up and business goes down. Um, uh, basically, I think I had, I expanded too quickly. I wanted, I had uh, contract hire vehicles through a, 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 a UK company. And um, business went quiet throughout the year. And I had, these, I had these vehicles and I thought, why have I got these vehicles? What's the point? Because I got the vehicles for courtesy cars. So when you drove in, you could leave your car and take a courtesy car. Wow. Just a waste of time. You know, why would you do that? Mm. But I thought I would offer something different, yeah. a customer service, mm. which is it's an overhead. You don't need it. Mm. So that was my first failure, having, having that first car wash business, overstretched myself, got into debt, having finance, and then um, a quiet spell came along and I couldn't make ends meet. So, and so one thing I, I wanna ask is, so like, how did you overcome it? You know, so for me, when I went through my, my lowest moment, uh, it was actually quite recently, actually, someone yeah. really, someone really fucked me. Yeah. Like, and then um, it was like, you know, you wake up, you know, you have anxiety. My first time ever having anxiety attacks, yeah. right? And then, wow, I'm kind of talking about this, my heart is kind of like beating a little bit. <laughs> um, but for me, it was like, all right, move. All right, do something. Let's go. All right, find something and just do it. You know, yeah, a, like, a, a real oh, entrepreneur will not dwell on negative mm. things. You know, long, I could have the worst. I could have the worst day of my life, but as long as I can go home, have some food, sit down with my family, mm. get to bed as quick as possible, mm. close my eyes, mm. and go to sleep. Yes, I may, if I do wake up in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning, and you've got these demons in your head, because yeah. things in the middle of the night are always a thousand times worse. Mm. And then when you go to sleep again, and then you wake up at five, six, seven o'clock, you have a little heart palpitation, because you're still a little bit nervous, what's gonna happen, and then you get out of bed, brush your teeth, 
have a breakfast and off to work and, and get on the phone and deal with these things straight yeah, away. And, and that's, Head that's on. what kind of drives you. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. Um, you said you watched Casey Neistat yeah. and um, Gary Vee. Yeah. Do you listen to a guy called Joe Rogan? No. Or what about like this, what about this military guy? This, you know, you know, you know. I, I watched uh, the one I watched with Casey this morning. He was with this Navy SEAL, yeah. and he was on, he was on about getting up at five o'clock in the morning. Yes, that's that's what I'm talking about. Him. Yeah. He he was having a conversation like like as humans, we need a struggle to live. Yeah, you know, like, we need like something to kind of resist against yeah. us. That that's what kind of brings yeah. us makes us makes yeah. us who we are. And so okay, so past that, you you. You've had the car business and then, you know. So that, that was probably when I was 19 years old. And then I had some wacky idea at the time. The Gulf War was starting, the first Iraq, Iraq Gulf War. And um, I signed up for the Marines. Ooh. And uh, the first time round, you know, I, was, I wasn't really doing much. A bit of a, you know, to be fair, when I was young, I was a bit of a, I was a bit very lazy, mm. you know, I had blonde, long blonde hair, I was a good looking kid, going clubbing all the time, but the girls and, mm. and um, at the time I was going, it was this, this girl and her father was a colour sergeant in colour, the Marines. Oh, okay. Very strict, very strict guy and he thought he was really good. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, pee, I'm gonna piss him off now, I'm gonna join the Marines, because it's really, to, to join the British Marines, it's really hard. Mm. There's a three day induction course, which you, you, to get even to get there, you've got to pass an, a, a really difficult exam. And then once you pass the exam, you go on this three day induction course in Devon and you go on the commando training course, wow. endurance course, jungle warfare course, swamps, hard. Mm. So I did that and I passed out. And uh, even to get past there is very, very, is very hard. So I did that. So I'm probably at this time now, probably 23 years old. And uh, I did that, and um, again, I was a little bit spoiled. You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've now in my commando training course uh, for six months, and um, I was there, and I had, a, I had a Rolex on, and you know, I was, I, 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 like, I love luxury stuff, mm. even back then. And the training team used to say to me, Jeffries, what are you doing here, son? Because they knew I had a beautiful bird on my wall. My, all, the, all the boys that used to have their pictures of their people at home. And I used to have my, my blonde girlfriend there. And she said, they used to call me Ken and Barbie. You know, like the dolls. What are you doing here, son? And after four months of really getting beasted hard, going through the commando training course, I thought, it's not for me. Mm. So I, I came out, and, but that really gave me discipline. Mm. Even those four months of sheer hell, and training physically and mentally, that was good. Mm. That was good. And then when I came out of the Marines, I basically did maybe two years of not much at all, like dossing around. I went to I went to Tenerife. That's what I did. As a Canary Island in okay. Spain, and uh, I sort of you know I was twenty four years old, partying for two years behind the bar, drinking, mm. you know, having fun. Mm. It's my gap. It's my gap with year and a half. So I did that, and then when I came out, when I came back from there, I got back into car washing again. Opened another car wash, um, and um, then on this one, I was introduced to a guy who um, introduced me to um, a government-backed loan system called the DTI. So what we did then is found car wash sites in the country, we set them up and then we got a car wash person, like I don't know, whoever wants to start a car wash. We used to set them up in the business and we used to get them the loan to buy the business. Okay. So our business was, here's a site, put you in there, give you the loan to buy the site, and then you got your own site. So we used to do, we, used to, we did that in, um, we did one in Reading, uh, Gunwolf Keys in Portsmouth, and a few other sites. Mm. Plus I had a, I had a drive through car wash in, in South Sea. And that was quite good, I was earning good money, it was fun, but I never, I never wanted to be known as Nick, the car washer. People used to come into my car wash with their Aston Martins and their Porsches, and, and I think, what am I doing? I want, I want those cars. Mm. So I had to find a way to get into the property business. Well, so there's like, 
there's so many things that happen within, I guess, like a five year period, you know, having the car wash and then joining the Marines and then coming back and then getting into, into real estate. I'm sorry, getting into um, uh, interior design. Yeah. Um, but I do want to touch on a few things mm -hmm. in your path before I get into, you know, what you do now currently. So you said those six months or six months or four months in the Marines. So I did, uh, I did my, f I did four months basic training in the Marines. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you mentioned was how important sell selling, branding and marketing was. Yeah. Why? Is this something that's a part of you that, that really loves these things? And why do the you trouble think marketing... is everyone, every, you have always got to be selling okay. all the time. Every, you know, when, when, you, when you walk into a situation, uh, you always, you know, you, you want to present yourself in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. And you're always, you're always talking to other people and you're always selling yourself, mm -hmm. you know, so no matter what you're doing. You know, you never know when you walk into a room who you're going to say hello to. And what deal you may be walking away with. Mm. You know, you may go, go into a situation in the evening somewhere and uh, and someone may say to you, oh, what do you do then? Mm. Oh, I'm, I, oh, I do video. And, and then you're selling, aren't you? You're instantly mm. selling. Mm. And then it's a case of a business card and setting up a meeting. Mm. So yeah, I've always, I've always been good at selling and presenting myself well. And me, and obviously now it's social media, it's building your own brand up, isn't it? Um, and that's, I think that's very important to everyone, mm. building their own brand up, being an individual. And that's why speaking the truth and coming, o o coming over, you know, honest and uh, open is cr crucial. Because yeah, it just gives you the head start over anyone else. Because if you can't do that, you know, you know, it's not worth me trying to hide all my negativities mm. because if I do, someone's going to say, Oh, Nick's been bankrupt. He's done this. So what? Yeah. You know, look at all this. Look at Richard Branson and Simon Cow and all the top business people. And they've all gone bankrupt mm. once or twice. Mm. Who cares? Mm. Doesn't matter. Mm. You know, this is business. Business is hard. Mm. Um, you know, I'm. All, you know, I, you know. I think as I get older, you know, I, I want. I don't want so much pressure. Um, but you know, I'm. A, I am a real entrepreneur mm. and. Um, you know, I'm always looking to, in, to for the next big thing mm. and putting myself under pressure. Um, so, so how important is, well, first, so you said you were always good at selling. Was there a technical thing that you started doing to improve yourself? Uh, you know, it, again, I think I, I, did, I did have a spell working um, in a clothes shop mm. next years ago, I think 19... 1980. Wow. Was it 1980? No, 1986. I was 16 years wow. old, just left school. And uh, yeah, just to sales. Uh, but, you know, nothing taught me more about sales than running my little car wash, mm. upgrading people, mm. getting a customer to come in. They want to spend five pounds, but I get 10 pounds off of them. So what did you learn? If there was a hack that you had to say, like, but what, what did you learn that says, OK, if I do this, I'm most likely going to get a sale. And this transfers, you know, not just, not you, just in you, cars. It's but. confidence. confidence. It's being upbeat. It's being upbeat. And it's like me today. It's, it's the confidence when you walk into a client and you walk up and you, they, they, they're listening to what you've got to say. They want a professional person to deliver something which they can sort of trust and you can, you can deliver a perfect job. So, you know, it's all about the information, mm. the confidence. Okay. And then so... But before the sell, there's branding and marketing. Branding. So. It's branding. It's, you know, if you watch Gary Vee, it's jab, 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 jab. And you never take. You wait for them to, to ask. I actually really do want to jump into actually what you do. So can you just name some of the services uh, that you provide here at Noo? So at Noo, we provide a complete turnkey solution for all design and construction packages. So basically... Um, a client may want interior design. So we do uh, anything to do with, you know, layouts, uh, uh, fabrics, flooring, anything to do with interior design. Uh, and then we've got architecture. So if a property needs uh, plans to create a basement, loft conversion, mansard, or it could be a new build, we take care of the architecture. And then we've got the project management. So we will 
have an individual person take care of your project, making sure it goes from A to Z mm. very, very smoothly. And then working with the project management team, you would have a quantity to su quantity surveyors and they would make sure everything works and, and, and works correctly with the numbers. And then obviously we've got the construction, the construction packages. So we do shell and core packages for the basements, uh, the side returns, the loft conversions, the new builds, and we do the, the, the high end refurbishments uh, in the properties in sort of Chelsea, Mayfair, Knightsbridge, Belgravia. So what I'm very interested in is the whole process. So say someone comes to you, they say, listen, I want to do, I want to, you know, increase the value of my property. That's my goal. Yeah. So to increase value to a property in West London or prime areas of London, it's quite easy because everything is based on pound per square foot. Ooh. So every pound, every square footage you add, there's a value to that. So for instance, in Fulham today, pound per square foot is a thousand pounds a square foot. Okay. Right? So if your flat is 1,000 square feet, it's gonna be worth one million pounds. Mm -hmm. If it's a ground floor flat, and I, then I create a basement under the footprint of your flat, that's 2,000 square feet. So that is two million quid. Mm. The uh, bill cost is gonna be roughly 500,000 quid. Mm. So 500,000 pounds, but to create 500,000 quid's worth of value mm. extra. Mm. So it's not rocket science, and is the, it? And it's an investment because obviously, the, well, let's say the, the price of the property will you know, increase over, over time. Over time, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and so what I'm really interested in, in your clients are leaving. So if you want to give up. That's all right. Okay, fantastic. So you have some clients leaving. Uh, so what I want to know is the process. All right. So once you get the brief, what's one of the first things you do? Do you jump right into the sketches or the inspiration or? So when the client comes in, um, we would have an initial conversation and what a client really wants to know straight away is a ballpark number. Okay. Because if you come to me and you say, Nick, I want a basement and full refurbishment on my house, um, and, but you haven't got any plans, you haven't got any drawings, you haven't got anything, all we've got is just is the, is the, is the estate agent's floor plans. So we have got to really give you a, a general ballpark on the bill costs. So we may say, well, it, it could cost roughly out of, you know, because we've done so many, we know roughly how much these are gonna cost. Mm -hmm. So ballpark figure, it may cost 500,000 quid. Mm -hmm. So on the basis of our first estimate, our ballpark estimate, you say, yeah, we, that's probably in our sort of price range. Then we would probably take it to a next level where we would say to them, you, we need to get a, uh, an architect on board to draw up a scope of works. Mm -hmm. So that's an A to Z on what they want. Mm -hmm. Because until you got that, we can't price it up correctly. Okay. It's called guessing. Okay. And that's why builders have got a bad reputation. So for instance, when we go to that, uh, that initial pricing, the ballpark number, you may go to me, you may go to Bill, and you may go to Ted. Mm. Well, with no scope of works, guess what? Bill and Ted and me, we're just guessing. Yeah. So when we give your estimate back, I may come in at 500, he may come in at 400, and he may come in at 700, okay. because we're all guessing. Oh. We don't know really what you want. Okay. So until you get this scope of works written down, the A to Z on what you want doing, what everything, then we can get a quantity of our on board to price up correctly. So obviously you want to do that as quickly as possible to beat your competitors. Exactly, but you, you don't, you, what, the ballpark, once they agree the ballpark, they decide to go with you. Then when you need to get an architect on board to do the scope of works, the client will, or they, we would have probably already had some kind of fee off of them to take it okay. to the next level. Okay. Because that's, for us to do the scope of works costs money and time and effort. Oh, okay. So we don't really want to waste any time and effort if they're going to go with someone else. Mm. So we've given them the ballpark. They understand the costs. We're now working on a detailed scope of works, which then we then price up. That goes back to the client. They agree. We then go, then we, then we say, right, um, let's 
let's go to a proper contract, which is a JCT contract. We sign contracts, we um, set a start date, and then we take a deposit and they move forward that yeah. way. And so what are some of the key projects that you've, that you've done? Or some projects that you're like really proud of? So uh, we've done many projects over the last seven years. Uh, we've done a beautiful terraced house in Chelsea uh, uh, called Tight Street and uh, amazing property. Uh, I think the client brought it for 5.5 million pounds. Uh, we got planning to create a 1,500 square foot basement, huge basement, and full refurb, beautiful, very, very high end. Uh, in Chelsea, the pound per square foot, I think back then, was 2,500 square feet. So every square foot, 2,500, 2,600 square foot. So we created 1,200 square foot a basement or plus. And so that was a great deal. So it took a year and a half to, to build. Uh, the build cost in the end was two million quid, I think. Wow. But she sold it for 8.5. Wow. So bought it for, bought it for 5.5, spent two million on, on it and sold it for 8.5. So what does it take to make sure, you know, a project like that is going, you know, it's, it's for a year and a half. How do you ensure that it's being, being ran successful throughout the whole process? Well, you have project managers okay. and obviously my team watch it very, very closely. Okay. You know, from the first initial person they meet, that person stays with them to the end. Mm. You know, so the project management team show the client loads the love. Everyone's, you know, everyone cares. Um, you know, the most important thing is any variations in construction, things always go the wrong way because mm. there's a million things can go wrong. Mm. So it's always, we have to spot these before they happen. And once, once they're spotted, we have a conversation with the client to say, there's been a problem in the ground. We've discovered a load of concrete or steels, or there's an issue with the structural drawings. Mm. Um, long as we're open, honest, and we deal with it straight away, okay. we can we can stop the problems. Okay. But um, that's what we're good at. We're good at um, making sure the clients are protected and their journey with new projects is absolutely perfect. All right. So one of the things I'm interested in is that you previously mentioned that you know when clients, when potential clients come to you, you provide a ballpark number. Yeah. You know, so you said they might go to like three, four different people, different people. So why should people come? To you, why should people come to new projects? So, new projects is a brand which has been around in Fulham for seven years now, and um, just where our, our office is in here, we get an awful lot of people driving by, seeing the office mm. on the way into maybe Chelsea, Belgravia, Knightsbridge, so mm. on. So, this is a quite a busy road. Great location. Great location. And uh, we have got projects on the go all over the place. So mm. people see our black hoardings, our big blue NUs mm. all over the place. So it's quite well known. And it is a, you know, we're, 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 a, we're a trusted brand where people can walk into our office. And if there's, is a, if there's a problem or they want to discuss anything, they can just walk in and we can have a coffee and discuss it. Uh, and our competition doesn't offer this kind of service. Mm. You know, we are a premium brand. We show a lot of empathy and care. Uh, we believe in uh, honesty and being open with our, mm. with our clients and just delivering a truly first class service. Mm. Um, you know, if someone's going to come to us looking for a really quick, cheap job, we're not for those sort of people because we, we, you can't get that level um, for a premium service. Mm. You know, we, we, you know, we truly are um, heads and shoulders above our competitors mm. in West London. Wow, so that's, you provide that openness. You as a CEO, you're very open, yeah. you know, yeah. and you provide that to your customers or clients or just people in general, you're very, very open-minded. Is there something particular or unique about London interior 
that's... I think the London interior designers, there's quite a few really famous London interior designers uh, who are well known all over the, all over the globe. Mm. And, um, you know, yes, um, I think interior design has always been for the wealthy. Um, but now it's become more affordable. Okay. Um, and the, you know, I follow lots of luxury real estate brands in America and their interiors are great, you know, perfect. You know, because obviously in America, real estate is huge. You know, here oh. you get a small little terrace house okay, yeah. for two million quid. Okay. But in America, two million quid can get you a massive yeah. detached. They don't, they use different construction methods in America. It's usually timber framed. Here, it's, it's, it's bricks, mm. you know, so it's different materials. Mm. You know, obviously when you go into New York, yeah, it's a bit like London, but if you go out, it's all mainly timber frame construction. Um, but yeah, you know, I think everywhere around the world, um, the, the, it's heavily, you know, the interiors are sort of catching up and the design, you know, I know an interior designer's just come back from China, she's doing a hotel in China. Mm. Um, it's global, it's huge. So I just wanna ask you a last final couple of questions before we leave. Um, first off, urgency or patience? Well, I've got to, I'm learning more patience. Mm. It, it always used to be urgency. Mm. But I think, listen to Gary V, our mate Gary V, mm. I think patience is very, very crucial. Especially when you're younger. Mm. You know, if I was more patient when I was younger... Would you be here today if you're more patient? I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I wouldn't have had more, as many trials and tribulations, but I don't know. But I think patience, having, you know, when young entrepreneurs want everything now, 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 finance for watches, cars, and bling, it's a, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Here's a, how, how I look at it. I'm a very urgent person. Yeah. Like, hey, um, so when I, when I saw you, okay, boom, hello, my name is, call you, boom. I'm very urgent with my action. I think in micro, mic, micro urgency, yeah. So if, you, if there's a meeting, let's yeah. get it done. Yeah. Uh, but on your big toll turn goals, patience. Exactly. I, I think that's how I look at it. Ur I'm urgent with my action. Urgent. I'm patient with the outcome. I'm, uh, if, I have a, if I have an idea, if me and you have an idea now and it's a launch a company, Within the next half hour, I bought the domain name. I've got the website up and running, and I've, I'm already moving forward. Yeah, exactly. I think um, when you wait, when you hesitate, you know that's not that's not really a good thing. So I'm very urgent. Obviously, you know we, we bump our heads, yeah. you know, but at the same time, there's greatness that comes out of the test. You got to well. test everything, test and measure everything, try as many things as possible. And if someone is not, this is a pretty tricky question. If someone couldn't see, right, and they couldn't hear you, how would you describe yourself? How would they couldn't see? They couldn't see, and they couldn't hear. And they couldn't hear. I would be described as like a, a, a kind guy. He's been so, through. So, but how would you describe that? How would how would you be able to describe you? Like I would say, they what can't physically? See. Yeah, they they can't see, so you can't show them anything, and they can't hear, so you can't. Tell well, them anything. I would say um, you can't say because they can't hear. I don't know. It's hard. It's a hard question, isn't so it? Like what I, I'll give you an example. So if I, if I, if someone couldn't see and they couldn't hear, yeah. what I do is I put a nice suit on them. If that's how, that's how I would describe myself. A really nice suit. Yeah. Right. So it's a sensory question. Yeah. They need, they need to feel you. How can someone feel? So they got to feel. Yeah, it's a sensory question. Oh right. I, I would say, if they, if they had the touch, I think they would have to. Um, just maybe feel my bald head. <laughs> I think if they right. felt my, if they if they put their hands over my head and my nose, I've got I've quite a big nose and mm. prominent characters and uh, my stubble, a bit a bit scruffy today. Right. But um. and then one question I want to ask is like, it's it's another like really trippy question, but like, if you were a property, like if you were a property, right? Which part would you like to re renovate? Yeah. And which part would you like to extend? So renovate, if I was a property, if I was a property, I'll, I would have to, I would always do the basement. Okay, no, I mean, so like, so within yourself, like what, what's something that you think, you know? Oh, maybe, myself. Maybe, maybe you can improve on, or maybe, you know, right. like, fix okay. a little better. Or... So uh, if, I, if I could improve myself, like I was a property, I would probably um, 
More patience. More patience. Yeah, more patience. Mm. More patience. Sometimes I'm a bit fiery. Okay. Um, I, I can get frustrated. Mm. Uh, but yeah, as I'm getting older, I'm I'm sort of. I think life gets better as you get older. Really? Truth. Yeah. I think my life got better in my forties. Mm. Financially, got mm. better because when you speak, people listen. Because mm. the older you get the more wiser you become uh, and people think you actually know what you're talking about. Uh, Even though, you know, in the beginning we were all, we all sell, we're selling. That means you sell, get the ideas to close and deals. But as life goes on, you get more confident. And yeah, I think, um, you got, you get, you remove yourself from a stage of trying to sell yourself on an idea and trying to oh, prove yourself. Yeah. Now you're at a stage where listen, I know. Yeah, I know. exactly. And then, so what part would you like to extend? What, what's something that you would, you would want to, uh, uh, you know, maybe do a little bit more, or I would probably like to do a little bit more for my family. Mm. You know, do you know? Because I, I spend an awful lot of time in the office mm. working on the business. Mm. Maybe spend a bit more time with the family, even though it's not a bad bad thing. You know, we, we everyone's got a very good relationship at home, mm. but um, maybe more family time. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, Nick, I appreciate, I really do appreciate you taking out the time to do this. Um, I, I just want to go and uh, kind of uh, acknowledge you. So uh, first off, you're a very, like I said, very open person. You know, I came in the office today, bright smiles and everything was fun. Um, secondly, I can tell you, you're very, you're definitely a go-getter. You know, you, you, you're tough now. You, like, you went through your trials and tribulations, but they made you tough. You didn't quit. And I can see, yeah, that one last thing about you that I know is that, uh, well, those are two things that I think it's very tough, tough as now, but all very open. And um, so I acknowledge you for that. And um, one of my final questions I'd like to ask all of my guests, London in one word. The best city. That's, that's three words. <laughs> London in one word. success.